So let's just pause a moment and ask God's blessing as we open the word today. Father, we come today with hearts filled with anticipation. You've given us the word of God and so often we become enamored with our own ability to dissect rather than our reliance on the power of the Holy Spirit to bring light and to illuminate the hearts of your people. And so my prayer today, Lord, is that you would hide me behind the cross. Lord, that your people would be fed the word of God that you want them to receive. And so God, in the preparation, I pray that you would sift the good from the bad. Allow me to speak that which you would have. And so now, Father, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. We come to the third in our series, Dreams with Meaning. Dreams with Meaning. Our first lesson was dreaming of home. Dreaming of home. And our main character was Jacob. Jacob, whose name meant deceiver or trickster, had a dream. And so we talked about his dream of going back home. And we challenged you to, to, to look and ask God, where is home for you? What, what does home represent? Is it a place? Is it a state of mind? What's home for you? And ask God to lead you to that place because home ought to be a good place. Last week, we looked at dream of a better day. Dream of a better day. For often we find ourselves in a circumstance that cries out for better. That cries out for change. We're in a place that it's untenable. We, we, we just know we can't stay here forever. There has to be something better. And so today we come to our third in this series. We want to talk about dreaming of what's best. And so we looked last week at, at um, really Pharaoh's dream. The focus was, was, was on the interpretation, and that was Joseph, but it really was a dream. It was Pharaoh's dream. And so today we want to look at another dream, and that's a dream by Solomon. As a little boy, my family would make annual trips to Miami for vacation. And I've got some folk in here that, that are from the Bahamas and you know what I'm talking about. Everybody made the trip to Miami. All right. We knew Flagler Street better than anybody that lived in Miami. We, we, we knew Grants and we knew Richards and we knew Burdines. And we'd often stay at the Ponce de Leon Hotel and that was right on Flagler, it was across from Woolworths. Well. <laughs> And you see, Woolworths had a counter, and they had what you had at all-you-can-eat buffet. Come on, now, I don't know about you. I was just a little boy, but I had never seen. When I grew up, we didn't go to restaurants. It was, you didn't, when I was a little boy at home, you didn't go to a restaurant to eat. All right. right? Only the tourists went to restaurants. Locals didn't go to restaurants. You ate at home. Right. So when you went to America, man, you got to go to a restaurant, and not only a restaurant, but all you could eat. You know, man, you went in there, and your eyes were wide, and that, that, oh, that chicken was so good. It was the, I mean, it, it was a blast that we would go in there to eat. And I thought about whether I should share this little tidbit with you, but I'll share it anyway because it's a long time ago. That's where I knew the word toting. Now, to tote something is to carry something. And I was told when I questioned it, I already paid for it, so I got a right to take it. Some of y'all are on board. Some of y'all are still trying to figure it out. I learned that purses weren't only for carrying money, but they was also for carrying chicken. And so some folk I knew were on that run until somebody got caught <laughs> with a purse full of chicken breast <laughs> from the all-you-could-eat buffet. Uh -huh. 
When I came to America years later to go to Bible school, there was a place in Florida, down South Florida, called Sweden House. And at that time, they didn't call it all you could eat. All right. They got fancy. They called it a smorgasbord. Yeah, a smorgasbord. I'd never heard of a smorgasbord. But if you're from South Florida, I don't know if they had them up here, but they had them down in Miami area, Sweden houses. And my buddies told me, man, you got to go with us my car, to Sweden house, because we're going we gonna to do it now. You got a bunch of burly college students going to Sweden house. You know, the only thing they were trying to do was put Sweden house out of business. <laughs> So we went to Sweden House for an afternoon, and boy, did we eat. Now, I, I, you know, I was the littlest one in the rap, but I'm trying to keep up with the big boys. By the time we left, I could barely move. Everything hurt. My stomach hurt. My back hurt. Everything hurt. Everything. I was just, I finally got home and stumbled to my room around about 5.30 in the afternoon, and I crawled into the bed. I was on the top bunk. The next thing I knew was sun up, slept the whole night. Now I know what snakes feel like when they eat. They got to just digest it all. You know, it takes a disciplined person to resist the urge to overindulge when it's free. Free doesn't mean just be like a hog. Free doesn't mean take it all. Even when it's free, we've got to exercise some level of moderation and decorum. But it's tempting when it's free. It's tempting. See, Solomon found himself in a similar situation. Because the text says, he went to God and he says, or God came, God came to him and says, what do you want? Blank check. You fill it in. What is it that you want? That's kind of like going to the smorgasbord. And, and, and even though you pay a price for it, the smorgasbord is not all you can take. It's all you can eat. There's a difference. And so put away your purse. Put away your Tupperware. Put your Pyrex dishes away, because it's all you can eat, not all you can take. So who is this Solomon? Who is Solomon? You've heard maybe the, the, the wisdom of Solomon. Solomonic wisdom. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. But who was Solomon? Solomon was the third king and the last king of the United Kingdom of Israel. Israel today, or Israel after, after Solomon, was a divided nation into north and into south. And to this very day, geographically, it's seen as north and south, with Jerusalem being in the south, Nazareth, Galilee being in the north. But he was the last and third king of the United Kingdom. Following Saul, the kingdom was forever divided. He was the son of David and Bathsheba. If you remember Bathsheba, Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, whom David had killed in order that he could have Bathsheba and attempt to hide the illicit affair that he had with Uriah's wife. And so that's who Solomon came from. Solomon was Bathsheba's son. But Solomon also wrote the book, of, the Song of Solomon. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and much of the book of Proverbs. That's who Solomon is. But Solomon didn't always, or didn't start there. For our text begins with these words, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Right. See, David was no longer on the scene. And now God was passing the mantle of kingship to Solomon. 
And so he comes to Solomon as Solomon is about to become king and he says, Solomon, what do you want from me? All right. Imagine yourself there and you're sitting there and God says, tell me what you want. I would have a list. I would have a long list of what I wanted. But what Solomon does next is instructive for us when we find ourselves in a place where we don't know what to do. The first thing that Solomon does when God asks him the question is Solomon looks back. Solomon takes a look in the rearview mirror. Solomon kind of says, says, God, let me, let me go back for just a moment. And the first thing he said to him is, you have shown great kindness to your servant. My father David. He doesn't say to himself, to my father David. Because he, that is David, was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. I want to, I, I want to put a pause here for a second. The juxtaposition of David the servant who was faithful and righteous and upright in heart over against the David who ordered the slaughter or the killing of Uriah the Hittite, the David who saw Bathsheba and went into her in an adulterous affair, is the same David who Solomon now says was upright and walked before God. How do we make sense of that? Here's how we make sense of it. Look in the mirror. Because while we seek to walk before God uprightly, there is always a part of us, whether in the past or in the present or will be in the future, we are not perfect. And while Christians can be judgmental, we're often judgmental without taking a look in the mirror. Because we can say this makes no sense, except it makes sense in God's economy, where we that are humans make mistakes. We who are humans are sinners. We who are humans go our own way. We who are humans do wrong. But he says, you have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. And so when we tell somebody about the love of God, when we tell someone about salvation, we're not calling them to first be perfect. We're calling them to first recognize that they're sinners. And so in the midst of all that David did, the Bible still says he was a man after God's own heart. And that really means that he was pursuing him. Remember the psalmist that writes, as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longeth after thee. See, it's in the midst of our dryness. It's in the midst of our desert. It's in the midst of our sinning. It's in the midst of, of our uh, shortcomings. Well. That we still long for that which is best. We still long for that which is holy. We still long after that which is righteous. I will tell you this. There are times when I look at my own life and I say, God, how can you use me? Well, well, well. One of the most humbling experiences in my whole life is that you people think of me as being some kind of spiritual saint. See, what you don't get is that I live with me. I'm glad you don't have to live in my head. I'm glad what you see is what you see when you see me. <laughs> Now, don't get it twisted. I ain't out there doing no major sin and all that stuff. I ain't living no double life like that. But, but what I'm saying to you is, I've got feet of clay just like you. I doubt sometimes. Sometimes I think thoughts I shouldn't think. Sometimes I have attitudes that I shouldn't have. I, 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 I'm, I'm human like everybody else. And so what we have to understand is that God calls us and he calls us to pursue holiness, to pursue righteousness, and to be better today than we were yesterday and seek to be better tomorrow than we are today. That's what God has called us to be. So Solomon says, God, Solomon says listen, God, you were good to my daddy. That, that's really what he's saying. You were good to my father. And I'm grateful 
for the legacy that my daddy left, even with all of my dad's faults, he still sought to follow God. The more I look at scripture, the more I realize that our standard of perfection needs to be tempered by all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now Paul warns us in Romans, Paul says, shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. See, we recognize the sin, but then we make steps to move past it, to forsake it, to conquer it, to overcome it. You know, that, 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 that response that Paul gives in, in his rhetorical flourish there in Romans where he says, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, he says, if, if you've got a heap of grace here, and every time I sin, grace covers it, he says, shall I sin, 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 so I can get more, more, more grace? See, that, that, that's what they were thinking. Paul says, whoa, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That's the wrong way to approach this. And here's what he says in the Greek. Well, may geneto. Uh-huh. He says, may it never be. And so we don't live just so that we can force God's hand to offer grace. All right. That's what he's saying. But not only did he look back, he also looked within. Many people lack introspection. We can see the sin in everybody else's life, but we lack introspection. That's why the text of the Bible says is what? Take the what? The mote out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. Because while you're taking the speck out of his eye, you've got a redwood sticking out of yours. And you've got to make sure that you don't get it twisted because you, it may, isn't it amazing how we can see the speck? Like we got magnifying glass, we can see that speck a mile away in somebody else's life, but in my own life, You know when you go to the store, sometimes I think Dollar Tree, some of the other stores, you can't get the card out the door. Why? They got a big old rod up there, right? You, you, you can't get the card out the door, right? They didn't do that for no reason. Some of us are like the Dollar Tree card. We got that beam, that huge beam. We can't get out of our own way. We can't get outside. We're locked up because we got this big old beam that's keep hitting the door. Or I be trying to get out. We can't get out. But little old lady going past us and bump us and we go, look at you. You ain't got on no nice clothes. Look at you. You time we boom, 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 boom. We can't we, we can't get out the door. He says, Concentrate on getting rid of that beam in your own eye rather than judging someone for the speck in theirs. He looked inside. Solomon looked within. Now, my Lord, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child. I do not know how to carry out my duties. Now, I want to make something, uh, a note here. There was King Josiah, who was eight. Solomon wasn't that young. But in the context here, the, the translation uses, I am only a little child. I do not know how to carry out my duties. Most scholars believe that Solomon was somewhere around the age of 20 when he became king. But he looks at God and he says to God, God, I, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to be king. You're giving me this great responsibility and I don't know how to do it. I'm young. I'm inexperienced. But God, I don't know how to do this. And so he looked inside. He was introspective. He saw himself for who he was. It's amazing how God always seems to choose the least likely, the apparent unprepared, the one with the 
lack of gifting and we, we, we all seem to know how to pick out the one who sings off key and who can't you know, why would God choose them God chose Gideon God chose Moses God chose Jeremiah God chose Joseph God chose Josiah God chose Paul who says of all sinners I am chief He says, when it comes to being a sinner, I'm the top dog. You, if you're looking for sinners of sinner, you're not, you found him. Look at me. Seems as if God always makes us think about who he's prepared to use. I've often said, those who have been through the most often have the most to give. Let your mess become your ministry. Because most of the time, those are the people who have grace toward others. Because when I've been there, I know what it's like. Our deficits become God's assets. A line from a song that's sung by many people talks, it says, just ordinary people. God uses ordinary people. He chooses people just like me and you who are willing to do as he commands. God uses people that will give him all no matter how small your all may seem to you because little becomes much when we place it in the master's hand. See, you have to be prepared to let God use your deficit to become God's asset. He looked within. He says, listen, I, I, I look back and I, I see the legacy that my dad provided. I, I, I know where I came from. I know my background. See, I, I, I was at a funeral and someone was talking about how, you know, grandmother, how, how, how grandma left a legacy. I think it was, it was at, at Miss Stevens' funeral. And they, and they were just giving so much uh, um, Accolade to, to Mother Stevens about the, the legacy that she left and the, the life she led. And, and, and that's a good thing because now her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren can look back and say, we are where we are because Grandma was a praying Grandma. Grandma was a church-going Grandma. Grandma was a Bible-quoting Grandma. Grandma was known to God and look at where we are today because we had a grandmother who knew God. So Solomon realized that looking backward was not as sufficient. And so he looked within and then he realized that he also needed to look around. And so he looked around and he saw what was happening. Verse 8, your servant is here among the people. You have chosen a great people, too numerous to count or number. Embedded in that, my Solomon saw the enormity of the task. Solomon said, all these people you're asking me to lead, I'm only 20 years old. And look at all these people. If he went back, oh, Moses had trouble with him. Everybody had trouble. <laughs> these were not the easiest people to lead. <laughs> First Baptist. <laughs> we have wonderful members here at First Baptist Church of College Hill. Great people that love God and want to serve him with all of their heart and all of their soul and all of their might. They don't complain. They never murmur. They always do what's right. And God blesses them. But Solomon knew that Moses had to hit the rock. He knew that Miriam and Aaron tried to pull a coup. He knows about all of that. But he also knew about his people and he admitted that he needed help. That's what he was saying. He says, God... Uh, Help me with all, help me with these people. Help me to be the best leader and king that I can be. See, in modern vernacular, what Solomon did was Solomon knew how to read the room. 
In the Phillips translation, Luke 14, 28 reads this way. He says, if any of you wanted to build a tower, wouldn't he first sit down and work out the cost of it to see if he can afford to finish it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and found himself unable to complete the building, everyone who sees it will begin to jeer at him, saying, this is the man who started to build a tower but couldn't finish it. Here's the point here. Solomon says, you know what, God, I need to look around me. I need to look at the circumstances before I move ahead. And he said to God, God, this is the people. These are the folk you gave me to lead. And in any group of people, there are multitudes of attitudes and viewpoints. And, you know, folk, folk, folk didn't even, you know, after a while, they, they wanted to go back to Egypt right. on Moses. Moses, you're out here starving us to death. We don't have water to drink. We, then, then when he brought the quail, they, they didn't want that. When the manna came, do you know the word manna mean what is it? <laughs> They're like, Moses, what's this? We're sick and tired of eating this manna. We want to go back to Egypt so we could have some, some um, leeks and some garlic. Now, I want you to help me with this one. I'll, I'll move on in just a second. Help me with this. Who wants a steady diet of garlic? Come on now. But that's how ornery and miserable they were. But they, 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 it, it was a, a metaphor for us wanting to go back to our comfort zone. And that was Israel's problem. Israel wanted to go back because where they were was not comfortable. And so they were like, Moses, we, 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 you brought us out here to die in the wilderness. You might as well just take us back. Well. And Moses showed his own humanity. Moses didn't react, oh, people of God. <laughs> Just follow me and we'll get to the promised land. Moses is like, if y'all don't shut up, I'm over. Bunch of well, belly aching. Y'all gonna find somebody else that leaves y'all. And you know what Moses says? God says, these people what? You gave me. He says, God, these your people. I don't know why you put them on me. But if you're a parent, you know that feeling sometimes you want to say to your spouse, they're your child. But fourth and finally, Solomon looked towards heaven. He came to the end, he looked towards heaven. Verse 9, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? He says, God, I, I'm coming to you. When, when it's all said and done, I'm looking towards heaven because I can't do it. I'm 20 years old. I've never been king. I don't know what life is going to look like. But here's what he asks God. He says, I don't want silver. I don't want gold. I just want wisdom to lead your people. I just want wisdom to lead your people. How many of us would come up to the smorgasbord and only eat enough? If you've ever been to Fred's Market, they have what's called the blue plate special. Some of you all know the blue plate special. The blue plate special are for us people who don't indulge. We're the ones who pay a little less and satisfy ourselves with a plate of food. Now the rest of y'all... <laughs> Y'all buy the whole hog so y'all can go back 10 times to those people's buffet. But Solomon comes in and Solomon says, God, I don't want the full buffet. 
Just give me a blue plate special. All I want is wisdom. God, all I want to do is to be able to be a good king. All I want to do is walk in the footsteps of my dad. I just want to be a good leader like he was a good leader. That's all I want, God. And I'll be satisfied. And you know what God does? God gives him wisdom, but on top of wisdom, God gives him great wealth. God gives him great kingdom. God gives him all that he didn't ask for. God gives him because what he asked for was sufficient to lead the people. See, God said, you can have a blank check. And he says, I, oh God, all I want is wisdom. All I want to do is be a good leader. James 1.5, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. Here's the Christian's takeaway. What are you doing for wisdom? Where do you get your wisdom from? How do you know what to do? How do you know what's right? How do you know that you're making the right choices? It begins by going to God. So if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And I will say to you, if you're human, you run up against that all the time. God, what do I do? You get a phone call from school, and it's the guidance counselor, and it's about your kid. Right away, your heart sinks. They tell you the story, and now you've got to figure out, what do I do? You get a diagnosis from the doctor. What do I do? Your spouse tells you they want out. They don't want to be a part of this relationship anymore. What do you do? You fill in the blank. You're up against it. It's a hard decision to make. What do you do? The Bible says if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. When facing those decisions, we have the example of Solomon who looked back. He saw that God had been faithful. He looked within himself and realized that he couldn't do it. He needed God. God, I need you in the midst of this situation. And then he looked around him to see what resources he had. And he realized that he had a nation full of people, uh, some good, some bad, some indifferent, all of it. He says, God, I want to be able to lead these people because I notice what's around me. And then finally, he looked to heaven. And he says, God, you intervene. I'm asking you for wisdom because I don't know the next step in the journey. Today, maybe you're struggling with a situation in your life that needs an answer. You need a solution, and you need wisdom. As a pastor, you get privy to a lot of stuff. And sometimes your heart does get heavy for people because they find themselves in, you know, between the rock and the hard place. And they come seeking knowledge and how do, how do I deal with this pastor? How do I get over the situation? And all of us have touchstones in our, in our life, things that we go back to when we find ourselves in, in difficult situations. And I remember sitting in a session one time with, with Pastor Brown. And it was a situation, he was the lead, and I was just in on the meeting, and, 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 and the person was really pouring out the situation. And when they were done sharing the situation, I, I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, um, he's going to come with some profound, this is going to be deep, because, you know, he old, he been lived, he know life, he, he been there, done that. I'm just waiting for this, you know, this jewel to drop out of his mouth onto this person. And he said, well, I tell you what, let's pray. Amen. And we went into prayer. And he asked God to give wisdom and insight. And in that moment, it was a teaching moment. 
It's a moment that says you don't have an answer for everything and you don't need to have an answer for everything. Sometimes you need to go to the one who has all the answers. The one who speaks to that person just like he speaks to you. And sometimes you just need to say, you know what? God, I need wisdom. And the Bible says he won't find fault. He won't laugh at you. He won't think that you're weak. He says he'll grant it. And he'll give you the wisdom that you need. So today I want us as, as, as church people to go to God. Let's, let's talk to him when we get in those situations. God, what do you want me to do? You know, I know I like to call my preacher friends. Man, can I, can I, can, listen, I'm in a situation here. Da, da, da. What, what would you? And that's okay. We all need people to bounce stuff off of. That's not wrong. But we can't forget the ultimate Go to God and say, God, what would you have me to do? And God will give us an answer. It may end up being through someone else. Because then he directs you. He says, go, go talk to this person. Go, go talk to that person. Go ask this person. And then God brings that about. And so as we bring this message to a close today, I want us to, to look at the life of Solomon. His dream was that God spoke to him because the end says God came to him and God says I will give it to you and then he awoke from his dream thank you for watching First Baptist Church of College Hill online I hope today's worship experience blessed you and would help you develop a closer relationship with Jesus Christ we want to stay connected with you and help you on your Christian journey so if you're a guest be sure to complete the connection card in the description. Join us for live online services every Sunday and visit our website, fbcch.org, to find out all of the latest news and events happening here at FBCCH. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss anything happening here at The Hill. And share this with a friend so it can bless them as well. Thank you again for watching. God bless you.